Hi, this is Emily Freitag, and I'm so delighted to be joined today by Natalie Wexler, who is an education journalist, author of The Knowledge Gap, and co-author of The Writing Revolution, um, and a bit of a celebrity, I would say, within instruction partners and education right now. So Natalie, we're so happy to have you on Rethinking Intervention. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. And joined today by my colleague, Christina Gonzalez, who is our head of literacy here at Instruction Partners. Um, so Natalie, as we start all of these conversations, we want to just hear from you about a story from your own educational journey and what that story taught you about teaching and learning. Well, uh, I, I think I'd love to be able to tell a, a specific story, but um, I mean, the one that springs to mind really is when I was in, I had this wonderful sixth grade year which uh, I just remember so vividly. We, I went to this school that had a very Eurocentric education. We spent all of sixth grade history on Anglo-Saxon England. And I remember all sorts of things about Anglo-Saxon England. And I had this very young teacher who um, made it very experiential. And we, you know, we formed ourselves into guilds and we pretended to be peasants. And we ended the year with a medieval feast where we, we didn't have napkins, we wiped our hands on dogs. And, and so it really stuck in my mind. But I think what, um, I mean, this tells me a couple of things. We, one is like, I think there is a feeling widespread in education that that's the way to teach is through this very experiential hands-on thing. And what I realized in retrospect was that that teacher was really skilled at making sure we not only remembered about wiping our hands on the dog, but we, I also remember about strip, fine, strip farming and, and villain and the feudal system. And so, you know, it, it, she really got a lot of content into our heads. Um, and that was, that, that was really what has stuck with me, not just those experiences, but that knowledge. And as I said, you know, I think the other thing, when I look back on my education, I got an excellent education. I was very lucky. I had, you know, highly educated parents who talked to me all the time. I was an only child, so we had a lot of adult kinds of conversations. I had, I went to this private school where, you know, um, I got, had great teachers, and, but I did have this education that left a lot of things out. And I think there's a lot of concern about that now, totally understandably and justifiably, but I have been able, because I had this foundation, it, I had a critical mass of academic knowledge and vocabulary, and that equipped me to find out a lot of things about the world that were left out of my education. Um, you know, I, I delved into women's history, and even though I went to an all-girls school, we didn't learn about women's history. I've learned a lot about African-American history and all sorts of things. I mean, I keep saying history because I happen to love history, but um, I've, I've been able to educate myself through my life about all sorts of things, including education, um, mm -hmm. which I knew not very much about 10 years ago. Um, and the reason I could do that was not because I'd learned those specific things in school, mm -hmm. but because I had learned enough stuff generally that I had a lot of vocabulary and sort of general knowledge in my head. And so it's not like, you know, kids are, need to learn in school everything they're ever going to learn, mm -hmm. uh, but they do need to learn enough so that they then can, can keep on learning. And it's not a, a question of, teaching them skills for learning, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, that goes along with the knowledge, but if you don't have the knowledge, if you don't have the vocabulary, you're not gonna have the skills. Mm -hmm. Enough to kind of hook in. Um, so take us into what we know works. Across the series, we're really trying to um, anchor to what works so that we don't create like a triple threat of inequity where it already existed, it gets worse, but then our response as educators makes it even worse. Um, so explore with us from across your research and your, your learning, what do we know, like what should we count on and what, what can we hold on to that we know works, um, particularly around literacy? Well, I mean, you know, one thing we know works is systematic instruction in phonics. Um, and, you know, there's, we've known, we've had a lot of evidence about that for a long time and it still hasn't really penetrated a lot of classrooms and a lot of institutions of higher education. So that's certainly one thing that we know can work. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff from cognitive science that, you know, cognitive science has made great strides in the last 20, 30 years, um, uncovering sort of principles that govern all learning. 
many of which, most of which, unfortunately, have not really made their way into teacher training programs. And, and there's some things that are being taught in teacher training programs that contradict those principles of cognitive science. I mean, from my perspective, the, the sort of low hanging fruit here is uh, the way we approach reading comprehension, spend a lot of time on that. And what we know from cognitive science about what works with that is knowledge um, that it, the key factor, not the only factor in reading comprehension is how much you know about the topic and how much vocabulary you have relating to the topic. Um, that frees up space in your short-term or really working memory to do things like understand what you're reading. Right? So you're not juggling so many things like, well, what does that word mean? And what um, we, we know that starting at a young age, um, building kids' knowledge that will in, increase the store of, of knowledge they have stored in their long-term memory. And that's what they're going to need to succeed, say, at the high school level. Um, we have to sort of keep that in mind when we're teaching little kids. It's not just that we're preparing them to read what they can now read on their own, but we need to be preparing them for what they're going to be expected to read 10, 11, 12 years or more from now. And the, um, so we need to, and the, and the most efficient way uh, to get a lot of knowledge into the heads of kids who are still learning to read, or, or maybe they know how to decode, but they're not really fluent readers, is, is by reading aloud to them and by having discussions. Um, and so those are the things that can work. I have one question and then we'll invite Christina to some other follow-ups. Um, and I, I asked um, Don Hirsch this question too, but I feel like this word knowledge is used a lot right now. It's it's a little buzzy. Like, what can you just describe for us what you mean by knowledge and um, what you would want educators to take away from this sentence of knowledge works? Well, I mean, I, I think there are different kinds of knowledge, but this, I think what a cognitive psychologist would say is it's a change in long-term memory, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, so it could be just, you know, the definition, knowing the definition of a word, or it could be like knowing the definition of, of the word uh, verb. Mm -hmm. You might have memorized that. That's one kind of knowledge, but then knowing how to construct a sentence using a verb is another kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's knowing that and there's knowing how. Um, and I think of this particularly in connection with, with writing. You, you can know, you know, the definition of a, a sentence is a, you know, contains a group of words containing a subject and a predicate and expressing a complete thought. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean, you know, the difference between a sent sentence and a sentence fragment, which isn't really a sentence, um, which could contain a subject and a verb, but, you know, it could be, although I drank the glass of water. Mm -hmm. you, you, you may know the definition of a sentence, but not understand that, that that's not a sentence. Um, so I think there are different levels of knowledge, um, but, and, and really, I think, um, you know, it, some of this comes down to what cognitive psychologists call deliberate practice, mm -hmm. which is either hearing, it could be just hearing something like concepts and words over and over again and, and also using them in maybe conversation, but it could be doing something over and over again under the guidance of um, an, a teacher or a coach mm -hmm. who is modulating your cognitive load so that you're not overwhelmed because there's just too much going on. But you're also, it's not too, it's not so easy that you're, you get disengaged because it's just boring. There's, there's got to be that sort of edge of desirable difficulties, as they call it there. And that's, and, and so these different kinds of knowledge are going to require different amounts of deliberate practice or exposure to things and an engagement with things. Mm -hmm. So I, that's kind of a long answer, but I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's no simple definition of the word knowledge. Mm -hmm. It, it does sound, because I think a lot of educators come at the word knowledge from like the Bloom's taxonomy levels of like the sort of recall knowledge. But mm. what I'm hearing you say is far more multifaceted than that. Yeah. And I think that the, the Bloom's taxonomy has been really misinterpreted because you see knowledge there at the bottom, like mm -hmm. that's low level. We don't really need to waste time on that. But mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, if you don't have the knowledge, you can't move up to those so-called higher order things like 
analysis and synthesis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Bloom meant you got to start at the bottom of that mm -hmm. pyramid. So, and, and, and knowledge, you know, your, your knowledge base should be really broad, right? And that the broader your knowledge base, the more things mm -hmm. you know, the better equipped you're going to be to analyze or critically think about all sorts of things. Love. Natalie, if you um, if you have the chance to sit down um, with some school leaders in the next couple months, and their question was, "What can we do to start planning for next school year? What are two or three things we can do so that we can get it right? What are so, what's some advice that you can give them? Hopefully, post pandemic, our kids are all back in school, ready, face to face learning is happening." What are some things that school leaders can start planning for now? Yeah, well, well, one thing um, that I would kind of warn them to be cautious about is this standard way of measuring what's you know being called learning loss. And that certainly on the literacy side and, and certainly in the elementary and maybe middle school levels and maybe above, you know, you're going to test for kids reading level um, and and if they've lost ground, then you put them at a a lower reading level than other in you know one of the things that flows from all of what we've just learned about the importance of knowledge to reading comprehension is that these reading levels are largely illusory um you know there is no such thing as a fixed individual reading level it's going to depend on the topic that you're reading about and how much you know about it and so what we and if we want kids to be able to read at a so-called higher level what we need to do is expand their knowledge, not have them practice their skills, quote unquote, finding the main idea, making inferences on books that are really easy for them to read on a random variety of topics. So the first thing I would do is, sure, kids need some time to read books for pleasure, things they're interested in, things they can read fairly easily. I'm not saying they should never have that opportunity, but we've got to get away from the idea that that should be the centerpiece of the curriculum, the literacy curriculum. Um, and really what, you know, if I were running the world, and this is not my idea, somebody, a, a cognitive psychologist, I think suggested this, I would redefine the word reading so that reading just means found those foundational skills, phonemic awareness and, you know, the decoding skills. Because when you think of reading as this subject that is largely comprehension stuff, then you silo it off from all the things that actually do fuel reading comprehension, history, geography, science, the arts, and literature. We should be, it's not that kids don't need to learn how to think about what the main idea is or to, to be making inferences, but those are not the things that should be in the foreground. What should be in the foreground is content, and then you ask kids questions that require them to find the main idea, that require them to make inferences, but it's not like, okay, now we're going to practice those skills, and you need to spend enough time on a topic and go into it in enough depth so that kids are equipped to make inferences, etc. cetera, um, and I would also bring in here the importance of writing. So I, I, writing um, is the hardest thing we ask kids to do. We have totally underestimated its difficulty. But if it is made manageable and if it is in, embedded in the content of the curriculum, it's a hugely powerful lever for building and deepening knowledge and filling in um, gaps in comprehension, gaps in background knowledge. So what I would say to school leaders, I guess it, it depends on the grade level, but at the elementary level, certainly, I would say adopt a coherent content-focused curriculum uh, and there are several uh, of those that are now, they're, they're labeled ELA curricula, but they cover topics in, you know, from that, that might be considered social studies or science or other topics. Um, and if it's at upper grade levels where, you know, like high schools really are trying to teach content, and a lot of the problem there is that kids have such huge gaps in background knowledge that they're not able to access that content at a high school level. If you don't know the difference between a city and a state, it's going to be hard to study the history of the United States, you know, all sorts of things. There, I really think, um, you know, you can't just say, okay, now, 
what is it that these, what are all the things these kids have missed? And let's just start at the beginning and teach them all those things. You should start at 10th, what it was 10th grade material or whatever it is, but you can use writing to figure out, A, what is it that students need to know that they don't know about this topic that will allow them to access this information? And B, if you, you start at the sentence level, you will not only be teaching them how to write, which is important in itself, but it's a it's so powerful for them to like have to think about uh you know what what is it that what do i need to finish this sentence stem what information have i read that i can plug in here and put it into my own words and when you do that it's cemented much more firmly in your long-term memory and you have essentially learned it hmm. so it's interesting as you're talking i'm noticing that there's like some construct issues that we may have in education as we think about what is the discipline of reading or what is the discipline of literacy. Um, Christina and I did a, an experiment a couple of years ago where we just Googled literacy frameworks and looked at all of the different sort of mental models that came up um, and how they competed with each other in a, in a lot of different ways. It, so you're suggesting a new kind of um, construct of what we think of as reading. And, a, and I feel like getting into a new construct of like the standards and how they even relate to each other across disciplines in some ways. Um, is there something in that understanding you'd wanna correct or is there anything you'd wanna extend on? Um, well, I think standards, you know, they have their uses, but I think they've been really problematic, especially literacy standards that mm -hmm. don't specify any particular content and read like a list of skills, which is true of most ELA standards. Mm -hmm. And teachers think, understandably, they should be teaching the standards. So if the standards say students will be able to connect a claim to evidence in text and doesn't specify anything about what text or especially because teachers are often coming to these standards with a, an orientation towards seeing literacy as a set of skills and strategies. They'll just try to teach directly that skill mm -hmm. of connecting a claim to evidence and text, but it doesn't work if the kids can't understand the text, for mm -hmm. example. You know? um, and and it, helping them to understand a text has to consist of more than providing them definitions of a few words they don't understand in that text, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. So I think standards have been a uh, part of the problem, really, literacy mm -hmm. standards. Mm -hmm. there. Um, in, in that problem space, what, what else do you see people trying? You've touched on a few of these, but like that we know doesn't work. So as we think about the next couple of years and unfinished learning for students and how we address it, what would you hope we don't perpetuate? Well, aside from what I've already mentioned about leveled reading and this focus on comprehension skills and strategies, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I would hope that there would be a, a healthier respect for the idea that teachers can impart information and should impart information and that it's not all about kids discovering things for themselves. That has a place. You know, we all do construct our own knowledge, but that doesn't mean we have to figure out our own information, right? Um, and so I think this is pretty pervasive. I think that there's um, a long-standing mindset among American educators that, you know, you shouldn't be the sage on the stage, you should be the guide on the side. But when students don't know much about a topic, uh, the, the, there's a whole bunch of research showing that the most effective way to, help to get them to learn is to be that sage on the stage I mean, not exclusively, you don't just lecture to a bunch of six-year-olds, of course, mm -hmm. you know, but you do explain things. And then, you know, I think the really tricky thing in teaching, or one of many tricky things in teaching is, is finding that sweet spot. You don't want to just explain everything, but you have to explain enough. You have to provide enough information so that when you ask them a question that requires them to say, make an inference or whatever, they actually have that information. And then 
you can, might be amazed at what they can do. And when I was researching the book, The Knowledge Gap, and I watched this class of second graders who were who had been getting a lot of information about the world since kindergarten and the, the thoughtful discussions that they were capable of and how much they the connections they could make between things they learned a year or two before and what they were learning now, even without the teacher prompting them sometimes, you know, it's pretty powerful to see that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, you know, I hope we can get away from this idea that the teacher should really just stand back as much as possible. So interesting. Christina, any other follow-up questions you have? No, I am just <laughs> copying notes down <laughs> rigorously over here. Um, it, it does, um, it reminds me of my conversation with Don Hirsch just around like how much, you know, the, the notion of the tabula rasa is sort of flawed and how much we do actually have to pour into children. It makes me think of my own four-year-old and just the connections mm -hmm. he's making in the world right now. And um, I want to say, by the way, that a lot of what I, I'm saying on what a lot of what's in the knowledge gap, you know, Don Hirsch was essentially the first person to say a lot of those things. Sure. And so I'm um, certainly, I and others are standing on his shoulders to a large yeah. extent. Well, I guess my final question would be, why, why do you think this is so hard? And with, with like a lot of due respect for um, the difficulty of the inherent task of teaching and and just that that it is a complex human endeavor right um which allows it some room for just being hard is is okay but why do you think changing practices and literacy particularly those that feel quite proven um encounter so much resistance well um i think there are a number of reasons i mean part of it is has to do with teacher training and um, sort of a self-perpetuating system, it's really hard to, to change. And there are these longstanding, totally well-intentioned beliefs about what goes into reading or what the role of the teacher is. It gets very hard to change those things. I think, you know, for, for practicing for classroom teachers, uh, there, I, so I like to say there are these three sort of categories of obstacles and, and uh, one is intellectual. And if you're hearing stuff that just contradicts, not, not only have you not heard it before in your training, but it contradicts some stuff that you've heard in your training, I think it's natural for there to be some resistance to that message. And then probably even maybe more powerfully are sort of emotional obstacles. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of teachers who've told me that they felt tremendously guilty when they realized that what they had been doing in the sincere belief that they were helping kids turns out not to have been what was help, gonna help kids. In fact, it may have been holding them back. And I think it's natural to raise defenses mm -hmm. against feeling that kind of guilt. And some, some people have used the word shame. Um, you know, and, and I think if you are a classroom teacher, you wanna protect yourself against that. If, if you are a trainer of teachers, you know, mm -hmm. you've, you've been sending people out into the world for years to do mm -hmm. things. It's very hard to hear that those were the wrong things to do. And then, I mean, lastly, I think, as you say, teaching such a complex activity, I think even if you want to do something different in the classroom and you understand the need for it, it can just be hard to remember in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. it's so easy to just fall back into whatever you used to do to your, your longstanding habits. Mm -hmm. I think there's another big obstacle here. And, um, and I think that's the way we go about testing in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and it's disconnected from any particular body of knowledge. I'm talking about reading yeah. tests. And so even if your kids, you, they are, you've been using one of these content rich curricula, building their knowledge. They know all about Greek myths. They know all about the human digestive system. They get into the, their third graders or fourth graders, they get into the testing room and the passages are all about, you know, the Inuit or mm -hmm. Amelia Earhart or, or whatever. They may not yet have that critical mass of uh, knowledge and vocabulary that's gonna equip them to answer those questions. And so that can be very discouraging for teachers. And, in, and even if you, it's, if you haven't even reached the point of adopting a, a content-focused curriculum, I mean, you may just feel social studies is not going to be important. That's not going to be on the test. What's going to be on the test are the, their skills. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. Yeah. 
it, having run assessment, I know how complicated it is, um, but I do feel like at the very least we should be aligning the reading passages to the existing science and social studies standards in a state. So at least there's more cohesion there. Yes, well, in Tennessee, and not Tennessee, I'm sorry, Louisiana, Louisiana. You know, mm -hmm. has um, this pilot where they're mm -hmm. pioneering a new kind of reading test that is actually connected to topics in the, the state's curriculum. PLA and social studies curriculum. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is used in, I'm told, like 80% of the classrooms in the state. Yeah, yeah. The, this is a some smaller pilot than that. But, you know, I mean, it just kind of amazes me that it's taken this long for somebody to think, why don't we test kids like on the stuff we've actually taught them rather mm -hmm. than the stuff that they just may have picked up somewhere? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's baked deeply also into MTSS and RTI systems and how we think about intervention for students as well. So some of that I think goes to the foundational skills in a helpful way. But um, I think this notion of reading as a skill set is deeply baked into education system as we know it. And yet, you know, thank you for your work and so many others, like really, really flawed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was just moderating this international sort of panel discussion, um, sort of taking off from the, the PISA, the international PISA test. Mm -hmm. And there were, it would seem to be a general consensus that one of the hallmarks of a successful education system is national testing. Mm -hmm. And I tried to make the point that, oh, we kind of have that in the United States. It hasn't really worked to improve anything. But all of their tests are grounded in the content of the curriculum. Yeah. So it's a completely different animal. Yeah, yeah. Well, Natalie Wexler, thank you so much for joining Rethinking Intervention and for this enriching conversation and for your, your body of work informing so many educators. Well, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Natalie. It was great to talk to you.